Hello everyone, Derek Floyd here, Beautiful Now Podcast. Welcome to another edition of Chasing the, the Impossible. This is the segment where I interview special guests who seem to have accomplished impossible things along their journey. To let you know, no matter how big your mountain is, how big your impossible could be, if they can accomplish yours, guess what? You can accomplish yours too. And if you love this kind of content, do me a favor, pause right now before we get all the way into this thing. Stop and hit me with a like or subscribe to the channel. This lets me get the most updated content to you as soon as it's available. Most importantly, if you really enjoy this kind of content, hit the share button. Let's make sure everybody leaves lifted, encouraged, and inspired. Now today I have the super privilege of talking to maybe one of my biggest musical heroes <laughs> that I've listened to over time. And when you have to get the opportunity to meet someone like that that's been successful, you always hope they're going to be really nice people, or you think they're going to be really stuck up. You never know, right? But these two people, this production duo that I follow for years, have not only done great work in the music industry, but they've done great work as human beings. They're good people. They seem to be kind and loving and just generous with their time. And you always hope for that when you meet someone that's been as successful as they have. So as much as they've given their time to me to talk to me for a few minutes, they've also given some time to you to share. So will you please help me welcome the incredible production duo, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Gentlemen, are you with me today? Talk to me. <laughs> we are. <laughs> and the crowd roars. <laughs> yes. Wait a minute. I used to have a little button. Anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> I took the applause button out, but they're all clapping. I promise they are. <laughs> How you doing, man? What's good? What's good for you guys, man? What's going on? Hey, man, upright and breathing. Uh, as Terry likes to say, better than the other way. Come on, man. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, how you on doing? On the right you side right? of the dirt. That's what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I love the blue and the red transition on the lights. That you guys got that planned, right? Yeah, we got the. I'm, I'm in the blue room. <laughs> and, and, and I'm in the hot bed. The ho watch out, watch out. The hot bed. I love it. I love it. I love it. Even as I sit and look at you guys, man, like I said in the, in the intro, you guys have been heroes for me for a long time. And uh, just to know what you've done and what you've accomplished, but then to meet you and just see that you're genuinely just good people makes such a big difference, man. So I hope people see that today. You know what I'm saying? Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so... You know, I'm going to jump right in and ask a few questions. That's what you're here for, to share a little bit of your story. And uh, first of all, let's just say congratulations on being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Man, that's huge. And I think it's safe to say you've probably written over 40 top 10 hits in the U.S. from R&B to pop to gospel, everything in between. Was this always what the two of you kind of envisioned when you first started writing together? I don't think we envisioned the rock hall, you know, I think, I think the rock hall was, it's, it's interesting. Not even a dream. I don't even think that was a dream come true. Cause I don't yeah. think we ever it wasn't heard. even a thought yeah. Yeah, when we came up, it wasn't even, it wasn't even in existence. Right. Therefore wow. not a possibility. Right. <laughs> but I, but I think we, um, I think the idea of, making records together and making music together. That was always our goal. Um, and obviously we wanted to do it successfully, but um, we just love the art of collaboration and we love doing it with each other, you know? Um, so I think that we were going down a path to, I guess, achieve some success, but we just had no way to predetermine that that was going to happen. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I, and I think, I think early on we had, um, defined our success just as being able to accomplish what we set out to accomplish that mm -hmm. was to, to make good music you know and that's kind of been the uh, the mantra for us for I love our it. whole I love career it. i think we never it, it, it was never about how many people bought it or sold it or any of that or radio stations played it it was just about making good music that's that's mm -hmm. what it was and contributing something back to the greater the greater good and see, that's what your music has done. You didn't set out, I'm going to be a millionaire, I'm going to do all this stuff. You said, let me just make great music. And that's what you did. And people gravitated to that. Man, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, yeah, we actually, we actually paid to do it, bro. 
<laughs> we did. We, we paid to do this. I love it. I love it. You know, I think about, you know, in a world where so many songwriting partnerships, you know, they go through all the madness, you know, like, like a, 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 these guys, the Eagles or the police or, you know, any of those partnerships that lasted forever. And you go, how did y'all survive being together all these years? And, you know, it's when you were together, how many now? You guys are over 40 years together now? Well, actually, we're celebrating uh, 40 years of actually producing records on a professional level, but 50 years uh, when we met. 50 years ago in June. Now, we see, met for the first time. that's a relationship. So, how did y'all make it 50 years and still? be able to connect and get along. Cause a lot of these bands, when they make it to the top, the police, the Beatles, the Eagles, they all disbanded cause they couldn't stand each other after a few cent- after a few amount of years. How'd you guys do it? Well, I, I think it's a work in progress every single day. First of all, I mean, I, I never think so far that we've done it. I think we're doing it. We're doing it every day. Um, first of all, I think it's a mutual admiration society between the two of us. I love Terry. There's nobody I'd rather make music with or even be around than him. And I think we also set a foundation in working together where we hand shook and we said 50-50. And what that did is eliminated most of the things we would ever argue about um, as far as creativity wise, like, you know, that's my melody. Well, that's my lyric. Well, that's my title. Well, that's my, you know, it takes all of that out of it because we're not trying to crunch percentages. It's just 50-50. So that allows us to be, I guess, individual in our togetherness, I would say. We're each free to do what we love to do and what we feel we're great at. But at the end of the day, it's Jam and Lewis. It's, it's kind of like the Beatles. Uh, I was watching the Beatles documentary and with uh, Lennon and McCartney, there was a sense, I always thought that they just sat in a room together and wrote songs. And that wasn't really the case. Like they wrote individually. Sometimes they wrote together. Sometimes they wrote individually. And it didn't really matter at the end of the day, it was always Lyndon and McCartney. And that's the way Terry and I are. You know, there can be songs that Terry does 100% by himself. And I don't even hear it until it's on the radio. And I go, hey, man, that sounds good. When'd you do that? You know, so uh, I just think that. I love um, that. <laughs> yeah. I, I just think we set the foundation for intentional, um, you know, longevity and, and, and that. And that's what we sub- still subscribe to that same thing, I guess. Yeah, yeah what I saying? guess. Uh, well, I, I always say uh, respect, respects, respect. And, you know, keep it as simple as that. You know, you shake hands, you do what you, you're, you're you have an intention and you stick with that intention. And there's a certain level of maturity that comes with that. And you just be mature about things and you don't expect someone to do something that you won't, aren't willing to do. And um, the other big part of the equation, I think, is never count somebody else's money. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, you, t- you, you you take care of what you take care of for your family and everybody's adult and do what they got to do. And so, you know, freedom is everything. You know, um, I, I wish Jimmy everything that he desires. I want him to have it in the best way. And I would never stand in the way of anything for him. So, I mean, he's the same way for me. So it just works out that way, man. You know, what, what when you love somebody, you love for them what they love. So, hey, it makes it really simple. I love that. And I love there's a genuine respect for each other. And there's no, well, he might just do it. He's going to change on me. And he, no, none of that. You guys said, this is what's up. We're going to live this out this way, 50-50, end of story. You realize that doesn't happen every day. You realize how blessed mm-hmm. that is. It's not like everybody can pull that off, right? Yeah. Well, once years. again, it's, that's that <laughs> a level of maturity, brother. And, and yeah. as my mother say, common sense is not common. So everything now. that you, everything that you think should be easy is probably never easy for most people. That but is for so this. True particular instance this has been a joy i mean we've been together this long and yeah. have never had an argument yeah right. yeah never an <laughs> argument never even never an come on come on never an argument never wow. an argument 
I mean, I, I live with my wife for, 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 for 15 years. We have an argument every now and then, so I'm just making sure there's got to be an argument every blue moon. But well, y'all we have disagreements. Yeah, we, we, it's different because an argument is something you're trying to win. A disagreement is something you're trying to solve. Ooh, and so we look wisdom, at it like wisdom, that. Wisdom. We look at it like it because an argument to me, let's say we have an argument. Let's say I win the argument. That means Terry loses the argument. Why would I want to see my partner ever lose at anything, particularly mm -hmm. something that I'm involved with? Wow. But a disagreement's different. A disagreement is where you maybe set a goal to get to somewhere and maybe you disagree how to get there. But then you can talk it through. And at the end of the day, it's not whether it's my way or his way. It's the best way wins. Mm, so that. Um, that way we all win, you know, because we're successful at the end of it. So that's the way we look at it. Disagreement is different than argument. So we don't argue, but we do sometimes disagree. But we can I'm talk about that. I'm going to talk to my wife about that. I'm going to save that for a relationship. <laughs> Just let me borrow that. I'm going to save that and talk to her about it tonight. <laughs> well, well, Derek, you know, ultimately... Uh, uh, we're, we're only looking we're only looking for the best solution we're not the best solution. looking for yeah, the right solution is is is, is fleeting like you yes. can make what you believe is right right now a right decision to cross the street and because you got the green light and the bus is coming and the mm -hmm. bus can run the light and then kill you i mean yeah mm -hmm. it was right but it wasn't the best decision so the best decision is when the bus is a block away I can move across the street safely and get to the other side. I mean, you got to look at things like simply. It's it's a very cool. simple thing. It's not that you complex. Spitting, spitting simple wisdom, man. Uh, youngins, I hope y'all watching this. They giving you straight ahead, <laughs> straight ahead simple wisdom that's got to be applied. Speaking of the youngins, you know, all these young inspiring out there producers, I, I got to give y'all a little bit of a nudge because these two are real producers ers instead of produce us with an as can you give these kids <laughs> out there a little bit of education about what a real producer does you're not just making a beat there's a whole other ball game to the production side that really has to happen if you're going to claim the name producer jimmy started off with this let me know what's going on well for us i think producer means um Kind of the same as a director in the film business. It basically means get the best performance out of the artist and figuring out how to do that. Sometimes it's a technical thing. It could be anything from what kind of mic to use or what song to do or whether we're going to do it with, you know, live instruments or, or uh, drum machines or, you know, making all those kinds of decisions on the technical side. But then it's also very much psychiatry, psychology, um, you know, therapy. Uh, sometimes, you know, a singer just isn't in the mood to sing or you have to let them know, you know, your voice isn't quite up to par today. Um, let's just take a break and, and just relax and all of those types of things. Um, but it is seeing, we, we were always taught that if you're not seeing the project all the way through, you're not really a producer. Um, and we learned from, you know, obviously Prince in the early days, uh, Leon Silvers III, uh, a little bit later on uh, when we came to LA for the first time. Um, and so we got to learn really all the sides of what record production was. Um, and so we, we had really great, you know, mentors to tutor us. And then people, even as we were growing up, whether it was Holland Dozier Holland, whether it was Gamble and Huff um, from the Philly International days, um, we always had people to look up to as producers. Um, and they kind of taught us what it was that we, needed to do wow wow uh jimmy and uh terry give me a little bit of insight from your side uh, jimmy just explained it super well but i'm sure there's a little bit more you can tack on that well I'm, I'm still learning as i do every day in every project and i feel like i get better every day and my biggest fear is to be a reducer a reducer <laughs> yeah <laughs> not a producer so uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to make a situation worse than it are than it needs to be. Like um, when you think you know too much, you do too much. And mm. sometimes you have to allow music just to be what it is and, and artists to be what they are. And um, you just have to get yourself out of the way from an ego standpoint and just do what's necessary. Now, a lot of times that's, 
a lot of psychological massaging. That's a lot of, uh, you know, comforting. That's a that's a meal. That's like I'm taking you to the mall so you can remember who you are, so people can chat you up and tell you how great you are, wow. so your ego can get on the right level to get this performance. So whatever it takes, that's yeah. what a producer does, you know. But you know, you have to remove yourself um, mm. from it. In terms, so it's of not the beat maker. He's just a beat maker. There's a whole that's other one, part. Well, of it, that's it, one part of it. That's, well, that well, can yeah, be a part of it. Yeah, that's that's definitely a part of it, you know. Of but I don't even know what a, a beat maker is a guy that just has a drum machine, right? I, just, <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah, but that doesn't qualify you as a producer. That just man, you know, I hear that, these kids it could, every day. It it could it could qualify you as a songwriter in a sense because you, you could you could do the underlayment to a song that that specific specifically makes the song or creates a song idea mm. that that could happen but it doesn't make you a producer uh because a real a, a producer interfaces and i hate to say real producer because i don't even know anything that's not real it, either you yeah. are or you're not so yeah. a producer interfaces with the artist and gets get, gets the best out of the artist at hand so whatever that artist is if it's a drummer if it's a guitarist if it's a singer uh, or form of any kind that's what you deal with so um you know, it, it's it's all aspects of it. It's not just one thing, or uh, it's a body of things. It's mm. it's everything. Mm. Well, you know what? You know, I got a couple of things that a couple people have been a question. I'm just going to throw this one in there. Someone said, "Did you ever lose heart along the way? If so, what got you through the rough patches?" Ooh, Jimmy, yeah, I can, can answer can that, one. that one. Who can give it? Uh, Terry, uh, got I, I, Terry, you got it. Yeah, there was a time. Ooh, probably about what been about 20 years now huh jim mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so it was a time that i really felt like i didn't know if i wanted to do this anymore because i felt like you know people just didn't really care anymore they were kind of phoning it in and i felt like i was phoning it in and there's so many different levels of, to to my feeling and my gut and my love for music it's like if i don't feel like I've, i'm giving my all or giving something creatively new and fresh and I don't know if I want to do this because there's other things I can do. And there was this young guy by the name of Usher that came along. <laughs> and uh, I started working with this kid, man, and he started re-inspiring me to just want to do this again because he was so into it and so available for it and just wanted to learn and wanted to try things. And, you know, that was a blessing, like at that point for me, because I had worked with such great people before. And, you know, they always had that kind of energy. And then I didn't feel that energy anymore. So Usher came along and he kind of reinfused me, so to speak, I guess, uh, with that desire and that inspiration, man, to just want to do this thing. And I uh, haven't lost it since. Mm -hmm. So this guy right here, this is your dude right here, huh? Oh, that's my guy right there. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, I, I got him all down up for you today, man. I try to pay attention. I try to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> that's my guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's he's an amazing artist. Just amazing, gifted individual. Period. So you know, creative force. Well, Whenever I see him, it's electrifying. So it blows my mind. Well, so better blue. the great thing about him, he wants to be great so bad. Mm. Um, in, in terms of his presentation, not to be great and revered, but but just to be a great entertainer. He wants mm. to be that. He wants wow. to give everything. And that's what's inspiring to me. It's not to make him bigger. He doesn't do it for that. Wow. He does it because he wants people to enjoy it. And he gives his all and puts his all into it. And um, you can see it reflect in all that he does. I mean... Wow. He's still one of the greatest. Yeah, man. No doubt. Jimmy, you want to throw something on there? I'll see you shaking your head. like. Definitely. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think I think Usher was great because we all, what it points to is the inspiration that the artists give us. Um, we're really, you know, we can write a song, but if we get inspired by an artist to write that song, then to me, that's really the key to our 
success. Um, because there's a lot of artists that we admire, but we don't necessarily feel like we have the perfect song for them or we could do the best job. So we always gravitated to people who we felt were uh, inspiring to us. Janet would be obviously top of list. Um, obviously people like New Edition, um, Alexander O'Neill back in the day, you know, there were certain people that, you know, those songs wouldn't exist without those artists because we wouldn't have had the inspiration to even write those songs or produce sure. those songs. So yeah, Mariah, Boys to Men, uh, yeah, I guess tons. Yeah, it's a t it's a team, it's a team effort. And then people that really pushed us when we thought we knew what we were really doing, we got in with Patty Austin, and Patty oh. Austin was just like amazing. Like we were going to do three songs with her, we thought we were going to take three days to do it, and she had sung the first two songs in the first day already. And we weren't even ready with the next song yet. <laughs> but she was so fast, and it taught us, you know, we got to be prepared and. And there's people that are like that, you know, and then someone like Michael Jackson, who probably our most impactful studio moment ever was when he went in to sing Scream uh, yeah. on, on the Scream song with Janet. But he just turned into like, I call it the Tasmanian devil. Like he just got in the studio all quiet at first. And then as soon as the music came on, he <laughs> killed it. Like he just yeah. crazy. So, wow. you know, to get a chance to work with people like that, they really bring out the best uh in you and we've just been fortunate over the years to work with a lot of great artists and make us look really good what a blessing man what a blessing and you guys are so mm -hmm. humble about it i love it um you know i know jimmy your main instrument is the keys and terry yes. your first love is the bass but do you two yes. have different roles in the creative process when you're jamming together or is it just like whoever brings up what who comes together when it's coming through and boom you ready to rock and roll it's, is that how it works? How does it come together? Well, it's just, it's different according to who we're working with. I think it changes. Um, I, I generally will do most of the keyboard work on, on a song. Terry tends to be more the, uh, as I call him, vocal master. A lot more of the vocal production and the, um, and the lyrics and those kinds of things. Um, but we're very flexible. And as I said earlier, there's some songs Terry does all by himself. There's some songs I do all by myself. Um, and we're just free to flow in, you know, who gets along with the artist, who understands kind of, you know, what we're trying to get done. Uh, sometimes we do sit in a room together. We just uh, um, just worked with uh, Shantae Moore and actually did a song for her wedding, uh, the oh. song that she walked down the aisle to. Wow. And that was one where we... Uh, we actually sat in a room together, the three of us came up with the song, banged it out like in an evening. We had the whole thing done and sang because um, she was leaving for um, uh, Cabo for the wedding. So sometimes we do it like that, but we just kind of, I don't know, we just kind of instinctually know what we each need to do on any given project with any given artist. And, um, and we're always available for each other if, you know, if we need the help, you know, sometimes I'll say, oh, Terry, can you come listen to this? And and whatever um i'll give you an, i'll give you an example is um we did a song with janet uh when we were working on rhythm nation and terry was actually multitasking because he was helping he was actually in the process of building our new studio because we were doing a new studio and he walks in with uh he had wallpaper samples in one hand and he had carpet samples in the other hand and he said which one of these do you think we should do and we said terry we need the song idea and we got this song idea and we went through janet and i went through this long explanation about you know, it's not the kids' fault and, you know, the adults are making mistakes and blah, blah, blah. We went through this whole thing for about 10 minutes. And then Terry just said, living in a world they didn't make. And we said, yeah, that's it. He said, hold on. Five minutes later, he comes back with the lyrics and he goes, here you go. And then he goes, okay, which wallpaper? <laughs> right back it's to the like, wallpaper situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you always stay on point. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you got you got to you got to multitask, but no, it's just it takes me a paragraph to say what Terry can say in a sentence, and that's why he makes such great lyrics. Wow. Terry, throw, throw your 10 cent in there. I know you got something to say on that one. Break it down. No, brother, no, I, don't, I don't even have a nickel for that one. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that you two seem to be unselfish about how you work together. It's not like well, you have to do this, you have to do that, and you just understand there's going to be times when each of you work differently, but you're unselfish about how you share, and you just, there's a trust there. 
All yeah, but, but it's just a simple trust there, no? Yeah, but absolutely, you should always have trust with a it's partnership trust. of any kind. But but you said the key word share, like mm -hmm. is sharing sharing when you would have an expectation. You don't share to get something in return. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to give yourself. You put yourself all out for it, right? That's mm -hmm. what sharing is. Yeah, yeah. You wow, know, I, I, I don't just want to give away my old clothes. If I'm giving away some old stuff, I want to make sure I put some nice stuff in there, too. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Be real. Be I, I, I got to I, I gotta make sure that, you know, there's an ability there for that person to feel good about what I'm giving them. Wow. Right. So that's just part of sharing. That's just, you know, either that's in you or it's not. Some people mm. are selfish. And wow. that's OK, too. You are what you are. Mm. You know, but, you know, being selfish, you never go very far because, you know, uh, we stand on shoulders here and Man. the shoulders you stand on. If they're tall, you'll be tall with them. Wow, if you stand on some short ass shoulders, then you're going to be short. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, just got, you know, you're going to be underground, actually, um, because the only thing you do by yourself in this world is die. Wow. Come on now. You can't even be born by yourself. No, but, when, right but, but when you leave here, they put you in the ground by yourself and you take nothing with you. Wow. Mm. Speaking of shoulders to stand on, there's, a, there's a, an amazing uh, musician, pastor, singer, songwriter out there wants to give you a shout. I know you know the Reverend John P. Key. He just said, love you guys out there. Uh, would love to work with you one of these days. John P. is one of my favorites, one of my, my best unks in the world. He's, he's good people. So just let you know that everybody's out there watching you and uh, John P. Key is sending you mad love. John P. Key, love, brother. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. He, he said, he said, standing on shoulders. That's what it's yes. all about, man. We all doing yeah. it. We all doing it. Standing on shoulders. That was such yeah, a well, wisdom revelation, man. Yeah, but, but we have to appreciate that. I mean, we don't, everybody sits around and, and complains about everything. Everybody's, everybody's got issues. Everybody. <laughs> I don't care who you are. If you got a lot of money, you got a lot of money issues. If you have no money, you ain't got no money issues. It's, it's, it's always going to be an issue, man. It's always something. So we should be appreciative of all that we have to use to the benefit of our life. I mean, unless you learn to enjoy life, and I always say happy is a choice. Mm. You make that choice to be happy and yes. joy, you protect it because you don't want nobody messing with your joy. But mm. happy is a choice. No one or nothing should just be able to make you sad. You should choose mm. to be happy and then eliminate the things that are trying to take that away from you because you have that choice. Mm. So, you know, like I say, I, I keep things very simple. You know, when we first met, we talked about that. You said good people just good people. I, 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 I don't deal with a bunch of foolishness. And, and you are exactly who you are. You know, you don't, you know, pretense, either we good or we not, we take care of business. Uh, I just love the simplicity of it. And uh, you yeah. youngins out there that are watching, trying to be all this superstar nonsense. Look, man, these are the cats that have done it over and over and over and over and over again. And it's just simple. Do the right thing. Be good to people. Share the work. Don't be selfish. Easy stuff, y'all. Come on. Come on. I'm just trying to help y'all. Trying to help y'all. Uh, so before we jump into the future of Jam and Lewis, we just talked a little bit about where you are and where you've come from. Let's take a little quick trip back to Minneapolis. Just give me a small one and tell me how did the two of you really actually meet? And was it music love at first sight or did y'all just fall in love later? How'd that happen? Uh, it was definitely music love. Well, first of all, it was love at first sight because we met uh, at a summer school program at the University of Minnesota called Upward Bound. We were both uh, junior high students and it was, I think, a six week program, but you got to stay in dorms like college kids, which was kind of cool for, you know, teenage kids to do. I still don't know how our parents let us do that, but, you know, whatever <laughs> they did. Um, but my first recollection of seeing Terry was as we were checking into the dorms, uh, I walked by a room, the door was open, and there was this brother sitting on the bed uh, playing a red, black, and green bass, and he was playing Cool in the Gang. <laughs> and I was like, who's this brother? I got to get to know this man. 
And so for me, it was love at first sight, uh, seeing Terry for the first time. Yeah, uh, and my, on, my first- Bring it up, bring it up, Terry. My first, my first recollection of Jam was down in the lunchroom where they stored, uh, cause it was summertime. They stored mm -hmm. all the pianos in the lunchroom. And I went down there one night, I heard music and some girls down there talking. And I come around the corner, I peek around the corner, I see Jimmy Jam at the piano and the girl standing over the piano and he's playing I think he's playing Color My World or something. So he's playing some Chicago or something. Look at and, you. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 the, and the girls were swooning and I was like, okay, I got to get to know this brother. He, he, got, he got the girls on lock right here. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So he, we got to get to know each other. So, um, you know, that, that blossomed into a, a great relationship and it was the end of, um, the year that we had a, a little dance at the end of the summer period. And uh, Jimmy was a, actually a drummer. And so- What? Drummer? Yeah, yeah Jimmy's a drummer. That. Come on, man, for real? Yeah, no. Yes. But all of my friends that, that were musicians, we, uh, Jelly Bean, Bean Johnson was um, one of my friends at the time. And um, he was a drummer that I kind of was hanging out with, trying to learn how to do this thing. And so I said, Jam, you know, we need a keyboard player. Your dad plays keyboards. You should play keyboards. Because I had already seen him playing down there swooning the girls. So uh, I convinced him and the rest is history. Now he's a keyboardist. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always about the girls, man. It's okay. Yeah, it, it is always about the girls. Especially and at 15, 14. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We grow folks now, but then it was about the girls. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> see, I, I used to see girls like, you know, you say see a pretty girl is like, like a steak to you. Now I see them as aspirin. Okay, I can lie to leave that alone. Yeah. <laughs> 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 leave that alone, boy. I got I to gotta, I gotta go home. Oh, <laughs> my <you> go. goodness. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I won't stay in that space. I love that you guys shared a little bit of how you met and I'll, I'll fast forward midway into your history just because we can't talk about your musical journey without, of course, mentioning the Purple One, Prince. I know the two of you had enormous respect for the, the gentleman as an artist, musician. You know, what influence did he play in your growth as songwriters and producers to your career? Well, I can say I went to school with Prince in junior high, as a matter of fact. Um, we met in junior high. We were actually taking a piano class together, which we, we both already knew how to play, but it was just a way to get out of our main classes. And uh, I had never heard anybody play like Prince. And not only could he play the, the keyboard, but he played the drums, he played the bass, he played the guitar, like he played everything. So I'd, I'd never seen anything like that. So my impression of Prince was already, you know, when I was, I don't know, 13 years old or however old I was when I, we first met, I, I was already blown away by his talent. Um, the biggest thing he taught me was work ethic. Um, we were working on the song 777-9311 and uh, he came to the rehearsal. And then when we were done, he said, Jimmy Jam, what are you doing with your left hand? And I said, I'm not doing anything, Prince. I'm just playing a bass part. He said, do the chords with Monty and use your left hand and your right hand, whatever. Said, okay, so we, I do it. And then when we're done, he goes, Jimmy Jam, what note are you singing on the course? So I'm not singing a note. I said, those guys got it. He said, it's got to be bigger than the record. So I found a note. So now I'm 7, 7, 7, 93, 11, I'm playing. Then he goes, Jimmy Jam, why aren't you doing the choreography? <laughs> I'm like, Prince, I'm standing behind a keyboard, man. What do you want me to do? He said, it's easy choreography. You should be able to do it. So now I'm trying to do choreography, sing my note, play my part. I couldn't get it done. We finally get out of rehearsal. Next day, he walks into rehearsal and he goes, 777. And I go, oh, man. So anyway, we start playing it. About a minute into it, I realized that not only am I playing with both hands, I'm singing my note, I'm hitting the steps. But I even got time to peek over my glasses. I got time to tip my hat. I got time to take my hanky out my pocket and... And it made me realize that he saw me better than I saw myself. Like he was like, no, you can do this. You just need to work at it and do it. And that was the thing that he taught the most to me was work ethic because he outworked everybody. He come and rehearse us for six hours, go rehearse the revolution for six hours and then spend all night in the studio. And then he'd walk in the next day with a cassette and he'd go, 
I cut this last night and he'd press play and it would be like 1999 or something, you know, like, wait, what? So that was the thing, man. He, he was just so impressive in every single way, but he just outworked everybody, man. And he already was the most talented guy. And when you combine that much talent with that work ethic, nothing like it. Wow. 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 Terry, what do you think? Give me something on your side of it. Well, I think the biggest takeaway I have from Prince is that everybody has an opinion of what you should or shouldn't do. And one thing that Prince taught me was that, that when you're the boss, you have to make decisions that are not going to be popular. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's tough being the boss. You have to make decisions based on what you feel. And um, a lot of times, you know, it doesn't sound fair to people. But until it's the same thing that you tell your kids till you get your own house and you pay the bills, I got to make the decisions here. So he he taught taught us a lot about making decisions and and, and he stuck to his decisions pretty, pretty honestly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, while we didn't agree with how he made some of them and it, the severity of them was probably devastating for us in some some ways, he forced us to be who we really were. We always wanted to do what we do. And by his decision, he just like pushed us out of the nest and we had to fly. Wow. Either that or be eaten by the by the uh <laughs> the ground animals. <laughs> because yeah, he he forced us into that um maybe not even knowing. Mm. Um but you know, making making tough decisions is everything, man. You got to just got to make them and like i say a lot of times i didn't agree but now i understand you know now you get uh, it yeah hindsight yeah, is super well, 2020 isn't it yeah and, and 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 his decision was best for us anyway right yeah yeah you know i'm saying that so uh, so that that part of it you know and some people don't appreciate what they don't like you have to you have to grow to appreciate vegetables <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's like you got to eat those things that you don't necessarily love that because they make you healthy. They make you strong, mm -hmm. you know, so we took it. We made it and he became a huge fan yeah. mm -hmm. of what we do. Uh, and, and, you know, it was always a great friend. I mean, we got along great after we established that respect. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no one respects you when you won't fight back. Powerful in those words. Powerful in those words. When I think of someone like a prince, I, I try to measure greatness in multiple areas. I think of someone like a Kobe. Kobe was greatness in the game of basketball, period. You know, people go yes, to Jordan, but I think Kobe first, because that dude outworked everybody. He was there hours before everybody, shooting every day. He go into Kobe. Yeah, but we, we, we can't say Michael didn't. Yeah, Michael Great. did his Michael, thing. Michael was the example. Michael was the example. Exactly. I'm just a, I'm just a Kobe. I'm a Kobe diehard. Uh, well, we'll give you that. I, I just, I just seen like that dude just really has something that was mentally there that, like a prince that showed up early. He already knew all the parts. He could teach you your part before you got on the instrument. That kind That's of right. dude. That's right. So, uh, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure they taught you that as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's, no, absolutely. That's that work ethic, bro. Yeah, mm -hmm. man. Yeah, man. Uh, and it's in a show to this day and what you guys have done and the greatness that you've brought to all of us that we talk about riding on your shoulders. You've brought that excellence to what you've done. We're trying to catch up. We'll talk about that at the end. But let me let me sidebar a little quick, easy question. The fedoras and the glasses, where <laughs> did that come from? Who brought up the whole image of the suit with the glasses and the hat? Who came from that? Well, it's always been a huge part of my life. Um, mm -hmm. Every man in my life growing up had a hat and a suit and a trench coat. And, you know, the glasses are just because my eyes look terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Were they bloodshot? you like, can I make No, no. No, we used to spend so much time in the studio, man. I, I, and I had children, so I would maybe get two, three, four hours of sleep. And I would be up all day and then up all night mm. and I'd get my kids to bed and do that cycle all over again. And so, you know, you get the bags and, you know, sometimes the bloodshot, but it wasn't from any narcotics. 
<laughs> I don't do narcotic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so the glasses are just to hide the imperfections. Mm. Um, but, but it became your trademark. Oh yeah, you well, know, you you, never either you saw wear y'all without the suit and the hat and the glasses. Well, you wear the clothes. You don't let the clothes wear you. So Come on. If, if if it's working, why change? If, if it works for me. I feel comfortable in this. This is my superhero uniform. Yeah, superhero <laughs> uniform. I love it. Yeah. Jimmy, give me your insight on the on the fedora and the glasses. <laughs> well, no, there's a matter of fact, there's a there's a picture in Terry's uh in Terry's studio that's literally him playing the red, black, and green bass that I first saw him playing on his bed. Uh in the oh, should I show that real quick? You should yeah, show that. If you got it if back there, bring it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Show that picture, just so we know. And 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 you'll see the Terry Lewis style when he talks about the hat uh, and the whole thing. <clears throat> but to me, the one thing we did was we used to always dress, go to the thrift store and get clothes because it was cheap. You could get a suit for ten bucks, twelve bucks, and then have it yeah. altered. And so we could look nice, but not spend a ton of money. Okay, move it over. There Damn. it is. With there the hat. Go. It's a little glare, but he got the Flipping hat on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's the hat. <laughs> and that red, black, and green base. There it is. Look and you that. was rocking that suit even then, homie. Yep. Come on now. That. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So that that was the style. And then the and then the thing, Prince was always a big advocate of whatever you're wearing off stage, that's what you wear on stage. Like you don't switch it up and put on like glitter costumes and all that stuff like people were right. doing back in that day. It's like if y'all walking around in suits, then when you hit the stage, you just have the suit. And when you come off the stage, you have the suit. Like there that's what that's where we're going. So I think it was a combination of all those things. But as you can tell, you know, Terry from the OG days, he was that was his style. He was a yeah, I have some, OG. Yeah, I have some little <laughs> kid pictures when I was like seven to eight man, <laughs> in a trench coat. <laughs> I bet you do, man. I bet you do. Going to church, bro. He, he was five years old with his hat and his glasses like going to church, man. You dress like the you dress like the OGs in your house. <laughs> That's what happens. Wow. Wow. All right. I'm gonna step a little bit further into your to your history. Uh, and how the two of you began your production journey. I mean, your production journey. Uh, string of hits, string of hits. I got a couple of images you guys might just be shocked to see. You know, you guys did quite a few things. Let's see if you guys remember these guys. You guys did the SOS band. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you rocked that with some Alexander O'Neill. Of course, uh, you know, you, you went through, of course, quite a bit. And you stepped into, of course, the time, another milestone in your space. Tell me about how these boys, the original seven, what the experience was like playing with them and how they shape what you do right now. <laughs> uh, well, Baddest band in the land. Yep. <laughs> them, them boy, y'all boys is just ridiculous. You set the bar so high. Like, who's going to top that band? Yeah. Well, I don't know. There's going to have to be some more bands to even be in the in the contest. In the running. Yeah, because no, there's not really a lot of bands anymore. But no, it was the best of the best for us because it was, um, first of all, brothers that we all respected. I mean, we all grew up playing together. Sometimes we were in separate bands and we were doing battle of the bands against each other. Like Terry, I had a band. Terry had a band. We'd go against each other. Sometimes Terry's band would kick my band's ass. Sometimes my band would kick Terry's band's ass. But it was always with respect. It was always at the end of the day. Like, oh, yeah, that Terry Lewis, he's, he's telling the dude, you know. So um, that was sort of the spirit of it. But it was cool because it came together kind of in a storybook fashion. Um, Morris Day had actually written a song uh, for Prince, well, or helped Prince write a song, which ended up becoming Party Up on the uh, Dirty Mind album. And so Prince said, you know, in thank you for writing the song, I can either give you, I don't know how much it was, 30 grand or whatever, or I can get you a record deal. And Morris said, I'll take the record deal. So he's, so Prince said, put a band together. So Morris says, oh, I got my band. And he basically came over and got our band, which was Flight Time. And uh, he just said, this is my band. So Morris was the one that really kind of plucked us and put us in front of Prince. Um, 
I think Prince was, I don't know whether Prince felt good about that or not. I've, I've heard different kind of sides of that story, but Morris stuck to his guns. And the thing that changed was Morris was actually going to be the drummer in the time. And Alexander O'Neill was going to be the lead singer. Um, but we had an ill-fated uh, dinner one night where um, Alex started demanding a bunch of stuff. You know, you know, Prince, uh, Alexander O'Neill needs some paper. <laughs> Prince was like, what are you talking about? He said, you know, I need a new car and a new house. You know, you know, I need, you know, Alexander O'Neill, you know, this record, this record thing is okay and everything, but you know, Alexander O'Neill needs some paper. <laughs> and everybody's like, what are you talking about? And then he, they set the plate down in front of me. He said, I'm going to go down and throw down this here steak. So Prince and Morris walk out. And so at that point, I think everybody thought, okay, our record deal's done. And the next day, I think Prince called Terry and just said, because Jellybean Johnson was our drummer, but Jellybean was the one that was kind of the odd man out because Morris was going to play drums. So Prince just called Terry and basically said, Alexander O'Neill is out. Jellybean Johnson's the drummer. Morris is the lead singer. See you tomorrow at practice at 10 o'clock. Click. And that was it. Time was born. Wow. So. And, and the whole thing with the persona of how Morris built the team with Jerome and all that was just genius. You know, like it's never, it had never been done that way. And when we saw it all for the first few times, we're like, holy moly, these cats are ridiculous. And hearing you guys play together, it felt like, and as we're hearing now, you had always played together. So you guys knew each other in a way that you couldn't just recreate. You guys knew each other musically. So it always sounded tight. And then add well, we, Prince to that mix well, and make y'all even tighter. Done. Yeah, no, we no, we, we would rehearse our, we would rehearse all the time. All Endlessly. Day. Yeah. I mean, we, we wanted to be tight, but we had played, talking about our musical education, so back in the early days, we would play, you know, a high school prom one day, a bar mitzvah the next day, a birthday party the next day. Uh, we'd play in gigs where we'd have to do like a dinner set, like of quiet music and stuff. And then people would come up and start requesting Johnny Cash or they'd say, hey, do you guys know any polkas? Uh, you know, like literally we learn our musical chops from playing a variety of different music, but then we also had to play the music that was on the radio that people wanted to hear. So we had to learn hit songs, which then was part of our musical education and then creating our own songs, was playing all the other hits of the day. So we had a great musical education um, as far as all that stuff was concerned. And I, you know, to this day, it was very valuable to us to know how to do that. And the other piece of it was back in that day, I also DJed. So I learned how to, you know, a dance floor and how to keep people dancing and those types of things and all of those kind of you know knowledge things were the things that eventually helped us you know be it tight as a band and competitively we wanted to kick prince's ass you know <laughs> so we so we would work really hard because we'd want to make it hard on prince we were just the opening act and we knew we were good doing a good job because when we got out on tour we you know the stage started getting a little smaller and then we didn't get any any sound checks and then we used to have like four lights and then all of a sudden we only had two lights and then it was all kind of like little i don't know like little stuff to make us work harder but we did i mean that was that was that was our thing you know we're gonna we're gonna outwork you but prince was the one that taught us that you know so it's like it just came back to haunt him a little bit i think yeah jerry what do you think was he spot on with that well, pretty much that was that was the way it was, man. That was that was the lifestyle back then. I mean, being competitive in Minneapolis was everything, like mu musician-wise. Um, you know, and it, if you really think about it, we talk about the baddest band in the land, at the time. Jerome is not really a true musician, but everyone else in the band, true musicians, and all producers. Every single one in the band has produced a hit, mm. a top five, top number one, top two, every every single band member. Jellybean wow. Johnson, Monty Moyer, Morris, us, Jesse Johnson. We've all we're all producers. So yeah. imagine a band of just producers just doing what they know to be right. 
And wow. the only thing that you have to do is police yourself. Mm. I don't have to tell Jesse how to play because he knows what to do. I don't have to tell mm. Jimmy what to do. He knows what to do. All I got to do is figure out me. Man. You can't man. get it better than that, man. That's that's the easiest gig in the whole wide world. Man. <laughs> and by the way, I want to and by the way, I want to shout out Jerome too because Jerome, the whole mirror and that whole thing was we used to rehearse at this place called the Yasm, which was the Young African American Male Music Association, whatever it was called. I don't know what it even stood for, but we used to practice in there. And Morris would always say, "Somebody bring me a mirror." And so Jerome was actually a roadie for us. And when Morris said, somebody bring me a mirror, Jerome went and grabbed a mirror off the wall, like a big ass mirror, actually. He <laughs> put it, and then he put it in front of Morris. And Morris kind of looked. And then he started like messing with his hair and, you know, all that stuff. And Prince was there. And Prince like literally fell on the floor laughing. He was like, ah, he started yep. laughing. He's like, oh, that's got to go in the show. That's got to go in the show. So literally, you know, Jerome made his own way. He made his own way. And he still was, yep. he still was like literally our valet. Like he would on the road, he'd like take our dry cleaning and he'd do all that stuff. But then he'd hit the stage and it was just magic between him and Morris. But that just, that just was, that's just chemistry, man. That's just something that just happened. Wow. Wow. You never know how these things come about. This is like behind the scenes. VH1 stuff right here. <laughs> I would have mm -hmm. never saw that color. Oh, well, yeah. There's some people call stuff like that genius. <laughs> you know, yeah. We call it it's happy, happy accident. Yeah. It's a happy, happy accident. Happy accident. Stroke of genius. And the Prince was like, you got to put that in the show. For him to catch yeah. that and for all that to come together, all yeah. you guys oh, were genius but, in that but, space. But everybody oh, called it, bro. It was, it was, yeah. it was magic. And, yeah. and then it's been in every show since. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can see it like when when something happens like that, and everybody starts laughing and dancing harder and just having fun. Yeah, and that's what we are all about. Like, we're just about having fun, man. And yeah, just playing yeah. together and having fun, man. Absolutely love that. Absolutely love that. Uh, you know, I'm gonna fast forward one more time so we can get through your history and to get to the future because I don't want to leave you hanging too long. Uh, and talk about others. I want to get into a little bit more of you. Of obviously, your your almost your biggest muse, but the the biggest portion of your history that started you into the catapulted the success after SOS and Sherelle and Anthony O'Neill is, of course, we know this lady right here, Janet, stepped up to the plate, and wow, you know your work with her ruled the airwaves for man from the '80s until you know what made. What did you see in her that helped you shape the Oh, you muted. Derek, I, we, you muted somehow. We can't hear you, but I can. Am I there now? Now you're there. Yes. Uh, I can, I can guess the, I can guess the gist of the question though. I can, uh, I can, I can, I can, the question I can was the question. I, I said I could what? tell I could tell by your all your hand signals. <laughs> um, you can go jam. Yeah, all my hand yeah, motions. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all Jan, it was Janet was, was interesting because Janet was um actually we were, there was another artist we were supposed to be doing on AM records. And that artist uh, didn't want us to produce them. Hmm. So John McClain called us and said um, I'm really sorry about that. Is there anybody else on the roster you'd like to do? And we said, send the roster because, you know, back in those days, this was pre-internet and all that stuff. So I think he might have faxed it to us. And we looked at the roster and we both landed on Janet. We just said, we'd like to do Janet. And he said, you want to do a couple of songs or whatever? And we said, no, we want to do the whole album. And he said, you do? And he said, yeah. I said, okay. So we had a meeting, but I, I will say what we saw was Janet, when she was young, if you think about all the early um, clips of her, like on the variety show with her brothers or on Carol Burnett's show or on the Cher, Sonny and Cher show, or back in the day, she always had all of this attitude. It was all just attitude, attitude, attitude as a little girl. And then on her records that she did, it was all this kind of very soft, I mean, perfectly fine, nice singing, but there was none of that attitude. So Terry and my philosophy was, we got to give her that attitude back like when she was a little girl because we know it's still in there somewhere and we just need to fashion tracks 
that have that kind of attitude to bring that out of her. And so that was the that was the goal. And also to have her come to Minneapolis to record. Um, so she wasn't around um, kind of the trappings of L.A. You know, it wasn't like bodyguards and limos and family and record company and people interfering. It was like literally it was her and her girlfriend came up. And that was it. And she had to drive herself around like we didn't have a limo for her. like we gave her like a Chevy Blazer and a Thomas guide and said, here's the hotel. Here's the studio. Find your way to the studio. So she had to become self-sufficient. So as we're talking about making an album called Control, where she's talking about growing up and going out on her own, she literally was growing up and going out on her own. And that was, I think, the key to that to that album. One of the keys to that album, for sure. Jerry, what do you think? Oh, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, that was the genesis of uh, that whole project is just being able to give her time to figure out how to be independent and her wanting to be independent and, you know, um, the trust that she developed with us. Um, and, you know, the key factor for, for me, um, for Jan, well, she's excruciatingly talented. <laughs> she's ridiculously talented. And just being able to gain that confidence um, was important for her at that point. But the number one factor that helped that was her fearlessness. She would try anything. If we ask her to try it, she would try it. And I think that's really important for artists um, to have someone like the barber can't cut the back of his own head or her own head. You need somebody to kind of to guide you around where you can't see. And she trusted us in those areas and, and she would just try anything that we would request her to do. And um, the music that we came out with was uh, like very forward because of that. Because mm. you yeah, guys did it, well, stuff we talked that was amazing. Well, we talked about earlier about inspiration, how people inspire you mm -hmm. to write the songs. And Janet was the ultimate inspiration because there, were, there weren't things that she couldn't do or that she mm -hmm. wasn't mm -hmm. willing to try to do. And that's so freeing as a songwriter and as a producer to throw at her and say, hey, on this one song, sing it in your low register, like, you know, like nasty. Like, don't say, sitting in the movie show, go sitting in the movie show. I said, like, sing it like when you had a cold that one day and you were singing. Mm. And it's like, but then trusting us enough to go, you know, to go ahead and sing it like that. And then, and then when she actually heard the finished version, she like loved it. She was like, oh my God, she says, this is amazing. Mm. Um, but then you develop that trust over the years. And then when and then, you know, when she says, hey, I want to put an opera singer on this song. I want to put Kathleen Battle on this song. I want to put Chuck D on this song. Mm -hmm. I want to do a rock song here. I want to do a real sensuous ballad here. I want to put a full orchestra on this song. Like you can go through everything like because all of the the trust is there and all of the there's no limitations. And so. Um, and we also had the opportunity because those were full albums. It wasn't like we were doing one song or two songs. We were doing a full album, which allowed us to not uh, chase hits, so to speak. We just did the best songs. And then at the end of the day, after the album was done, then a few other songs would kind of raise their hand and go, I think I should be the single, you know. So it was different than rather than to make singles. We were just making complete albums. And then we were able to sequence the album. So there was a story being told. There were segues between the songs. And um, it was just a great opportunity to, to be able to do that. So a lot of things aligned mm -hmm. on on those Janet albums. And I, and I think people, even myself as a, as, a, as a listener and then as a songwriter myself, when I would listen to those records, they were sonically sound. We got just some things that hadn't really been coming out using different drum machines, using different synths, you know, you know, the the that one particular sound you had and the other nations that, that whatever that sound was, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff was just so groundbreaking. And I think people are still trying to chase that now. Um, do you look back and go, man, can we recreate that? Or do you just continue to think forward or, or how when you're thinking in creative now? That's a great question. Um, I think that we always even in looking forward, we're certainly aware of what we've done in the past and you can't really teach experience. So what we've learned is from experience doing those things. 
I think it was really important for us to have those kind of sonic ID things that associated with Janet because we always wanted to give everybody their own sound. So if you think about the sounds we used on Janet, we didn't really use those on other artists because we worked with a whole lot of, you know, female artists. Um, obviously, you know, from Mary J. Blige to uh, Patti LaBelle to uh, Sherelle to, I mean, you know, you could just name people. But everybody kind of had their own sonic and their own sound, which was very intentional uh, that we did that. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think it was interesting when we did Unbreakable, which was the last full album that we did with Janet. Um, I think it felt very much to us kind of like control because the spirit was the same where there was no record company interference. Nobody even knew we were making the record. Um, but it was just all about, you know, great lyrics and great um songs great production and once again just kind of all over the place um using sampling as you said using synthesizers in a different way drum machines in a different way and i have to mention at this point too um particularly on the early janet records is uh steve hodge who was our engineer and steve hodge was the one that had to clean up the mess that we made in recording the record because we recorded we recorded control way too loud um but when he mixed it uh, he was able to, you know, save it basically and make it sound wonderful. Um, and as Terry says, happy accidents. The fact that we recorded it too loud is why it sounds the way it sounds. It has this kind of frantic edge to it, um, which we learned from Prince because that was the thing. He always recorded everything in the red on his records. So a lot of education and a lot of things went into it, but a lot of star alignment happened, you know. On happy accidents. Records. Happy mm -hmm. accidents. Yes, sir. <laughs> you, you guys have got me believing happy access i'm looking for mine um <laughs> yeah with the success of janet firmly under your belt you know the two of you began to explore other sounds other bands you opened up perspective records correct mm -hmm. and you know with a string of artists that you were working on you were bringing other people in uh make condition uh which uh what was it sounds of blackness so you had a couple of great artists that pop off the gate and, you know, and like you said, you work with Boys to Men, which I know I have some, you work with these boys here. Uh, you did some new addition as you were growing and getting and growing your sound uh, and exploring. And and at the same time, you know, you, you jumped in and got some Mary J. Blige in there. Uh, and of course, you even rocked out with some, some Charlie. I mean, you started to really build your repertoire there as you were growing your sound. Um, you know, was there ever an artist that you said, Oh man, I can't believe we get to work with this person. Like you were like starstruck. Was there ever that moment where you're like, "Oh my God, this person"? How did that happen? And how the how that whole track end up being put together? <laughs> Jerry knows what yeah, already. He already talking about it. I no, I I think all of them. I, I think any of the people that you've mentioned, we wanted to work with them. Um, there were some other people that were mentioned for us to work with. We didn't feel inspired as much by love them, but just, you know, we didn't feel like we were the best people for the job. And that's the only way that we would uh, receive any job is to receive it, knowing that we got at least a solution for something. Um, and so that was, that was kind of our motif in how we paint it. And all the art artists that you've mentioned or any artists that you've ever seen us work with, this is because we felt inspired or, or were, and, and were worthy uh, to step up to the plate for the challenge. So we wanted to we want to get that hit. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Terry Terry is was absolutely right. We were excited about every one of those people you mentioned. We were excited to work with them because we're huge fans of each of those artists. Mm. I mean, New Edition was like we saw we heard New Edition. We were on tour in Boston, as a matter of fact, I think on the controversy tour with Prince and heard New Edition yep. for the, no, the 1999 tour rather. And we heard New Edition for the first time in a club. And we Candy were like, girl. went to the DJ and we were like, who did that? Who's this? You know? So the, so the, then to hear them like that and just be fans, but then actually get to work with them, we were so excited about that. That was, that was amazing. Um, Boys to Men, Boys to Men sought us out and said, uh, they they played us our their album and they said, what do we need? What are we missing on our album? And we said, you don't have a begging song on your album. And they said, what do you mean? We said, you, you're you good at begging, you know, down on my knees, begging you please. Like, you, 
we need a begging song. So we did on bended knee because of that, you know? Wow. So that's the right acts really inspire you. And so everybody we work with from, you know, and, and the people we grew up listening to like earth, wind and fire, when Terry and I met earth, wind and fire was our soundtrack. Terry turned me on to earth, wind and fire. Like I, I hadn't even heard of him. And he said, man, you got to listen to this. So we got a chance to actually work with earth, wind and fire. And we got a chance to work with Barry White and we got a chance to work with, um, you know, like I said earlier, Patti LaBelle. We got to work with the Isley Brothers, um, we, Charlie Wilson. I mean, these are people we grew up idolizing their music and loving their music. And then all of a sudden we get to be in a studio with them, creating with them. <laughs> the best was Barry White. Barry White said um, we played him a demo of a song we had done. Um, I think it was called Come On, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, it was. Come on. Right. And I and I did the and I did the I tried to do a Barry White impression on the uh on the demo to the song. And I'm like, I'm like yeah, yeah, baby. Yeah. You know, I'm doing all this kind of stuff. And I swear to God, we put the song on and we and at the end of it there was just kind of silence. It went off and we said Mr. White. We never called him Barry, it was always Mr. White. Mr. White, what did, what did you think? And he sat there for a second and then he just reared back and left. And he went, oh, ha, 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 ha. Sounds like me. <laughs> and we're like, oh, sounds like you. Okay, cool. And then, we, of course, we did the song and he, he absolutely killed it. But that was always the greatest compliment that an artist could give us is if we wrote a song for them and it sounded like them. They felt it sounded like when we did the Isley Brothers, I remember ronald just started singing like before we could even sing him the melody to the song he started singing and then ernie went you guys got an acoustic guitar like he already like when artists when you connect with artists like that that's always the greatest feeling so i say that to say we're excited about everybody we're working with we're just super excited to be working with them it's like a dream come true mm, mm, mm. i love that you're you're so again so humble to, to just still be a fan you know you get to a level of success but you're still a fan and that's what makes you such easy, such great producers but easy to work with uh and easy to to create and have that inspiration so so thankful to have that in you so thankful to have that in you um i know we're running out of time and i, I always told you guys an hour so I, I only had one or two more questions to close this off but important questions to close off the rest of the interview and again thank you so much for spending time and talking with me and talking with the fans out there. They've been waiting to talk to you all day. People still jumping in, saying little stuff in the background. I got some people coming <laughs> in saying, hey, here's uh, James Hicks saying greatness in the house. Uh, we got my boy Ray Williams from Music Marketing Canada saying hello, Jimmy and Terry. Uh, we What's got up, Eddie. Ray? And you, know, you guys know Ray? There of course go. I do. Everybody knows Ray. The dude knows everybody. That's right. <laughs> we got good evening from Manchester, UK out there. Uh, we got uh, Cheerio. Who else we got dumping in? One of my boys, DJ Strick, is out in the house. Great to see you guys together after all these years. Uh, and you still might know this guy, a little bit of Bluetooth, Eric Bluetooth Griggs. See, I'm trying to come up, fellas, standing on your shoulders. A lot of guys out there just trying to give you love. So people still drop in and say hey. Yeah. Um, awesome. With. Now that you've arrived, quote unquote, the career, you've done it all, you finally speak to every artist and you say it's time to release your own project. It's finally time to go. Volume one, Jam and Lewis. You bring everybody. You bring the hitters. You bring Mary J. Blige. You bring your boy Babyface. I mean, you bring the heavy hitters to jump in and do this one with you. And everybody comes together. You bring the, the of course, Usher. You bring your boys in there and you say, hey, let's make this record. Does this represent more of a new evolution of Jamin Lewis as artists? Or are you still going to be producers and artists at the same time? What does this look for for you guys now? Yeah, I think we'll do some multitasking. So <laughs> we... So when we, when we got inducted in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, uh, I think it was five or six years ago now, when we were on the red carpet, they asked us, they said, what is it that you haven't done that you still want to do? And we said, we looked over at Babyface, who was getting inducted the same year as us, which was very cool. And we said, uh, well, we never worked with Babyface, so I think we'd like to do that. And then I said, and we never figured out, we never finished our album. We started an album, a Jam and Lewis album long ago. 
Uh, Janet stole What Have You Done For Me Lately from us uh, for, to make her record. And so we stopped doing our record and just started producing. I said, so we probably will get back into doing our own album. And the other thing we haven't done is we've never toured and played our own songs live. Um, and at the Songwriters Hall of Fame, we actually played our own songs live. And so everybody after that said, you know, I think we played Human and we played Optimistic. And everybody said, man, it was great seeing you guys perform your own songs. So we put it on our list of things to do. So we obviously did the Babyface thing. We obviously did our Jam and Lewis Volume 1. Volume 2 is on the way. <laughs> but we still haven't done the live thing. So that's the thing we're looking forward to doing. Um, so Jam and Lewis as artists, I guess, is kind of the thing. One of those fits into the category of things we haven't done yet. And so, um, yeah, we're looking forward to that. But we're still going to write and produce because that's what it is that we do. So, yeah, I think it'll be a and, and you, you, you said something earlier about arrival. <laughs> See, my, my take on it is different. Uh, the journey is the most important thing. I love the mm -hmm. journey and I hope I never arrive. Because that when because once you arrive, you have nowhere else to go. Wow! Can I take that? Can I steal that one too? You can just once you arrive, you, you got a whole bag full of stuff you stealing, brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, all day. Just, <laughs> just bring my bag back. <laughs> <laughs> it's wisdom being thrown out here. I got to save this, man. What are you talking about? Once yeah, you no, arrive, you know, nowhere else to go. I'm at the should, We should always that's... be learning and growing and thinking and mm. encouraging and ins inspiring. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. You know, this is the, the this is the divine art, as Jimmy Jam oh, always says. You know, and mm -hmm. you know that's that's what we should be uh, using it for. You know, yeah. to inspire. I love it. I love it. That's, and that's part of what this segment's about. We call it chasing the impossible. We want to uplift, encourage, and inspire people. It's all it's about, man, bringing, sending something back positive and giving somebody some hope because people are going yes, through sir. it out there, you know? What you yeah. write oh, yeah. gives people hope. Yeah. Gives people hope. Gives people hope. Last question. This is easy. We're going to get you out of here. And again, thank you so much for taking the time. This was important, though. Uh, with everything you've learned along the way as producers and songwriters, what's the one piece of advice you tell your younger self to follow? to achieve the success that you've reached today? Wow. You want to go first, Jam, or you want me to go? <laughs> Why don't you go? Because I, I, don't, I don't know. What would you yeah. tell your younger self that you've learned to help them see the success where you are? And they got to, you give them this one piece that's going to take them from where they are to where you are now. Don't, don't change a thing. Be appreciative. Don't be afraid to feel how you feel. Don't be afraid mm. to say no. No is the most important word in your vocabulary because it, it knocks a bunch of nonsense out of your way so that you can focus in on what's important. Um, you know, you only uh, trust as much as you can trust yourself. So be trustworthy. Be worthy of that trust that other people give you. Therefore, you will be able to trust. Um, there's a whole lot of little things I tell myself, but once again, it's just kind of what I live by. It's, you know, stay out of your own way. Mm. Don't, don't, don't get impressed by your own press. <laughs> so it's, you know, you, you're only as good as your next song. <laughs> it's mm. like, a, it's a lot of little things that you just, you know, you, you can't rest, man. Yesterday's yeah. score don't count today's game. You gotta, you gotta keep it moving. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is the playoffs, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Lakers. Watch out. I think my Lakers. Are this, this is the playoffs. You know, you got to you got to bring your best every day. <laughs> Jimmy, what about you? I guess I would say, I mean, I think the thing that I've learned in my older, more mature life, uh, through a series of circumstances is that you can't it's it's at the end of the day, it's God's plan. You can control what you can control. Don't spend a lot of time on things you can't control. If you do the right thing, if you're doing the right things for you, um, then you can't worry about what other people are doing against you or whatever, because you can't really control that. So just mm -hmm. control your narrative for yourself. Um, 
And I, I feel that it's, I, I, I tell my kids that all the time. There's like stuff at a certain point you can't control it. So don't worry about the things you can't control. I mean, the, the, for us, the metaphor in Terry in my life, I mean, I think the main metaphor is, you know, when we got caught in the snowstorm in Atlanta and missed the time gig. And we had that moment of why is this happening to us? We couldn't figure out why it was happening. And literally the same day that Prince fired us was the day that we mixed what we had recorded in Atlanta, which was SOS band, Just Be Good To Me. And our career as producers was born. So in that moment, we're questioning why it's happening. Now, I think while we ask the question, why is it happening? We don't dwell on it. It's like we know the things we can control and we try to do that to the best of our ability. Um, and the thing that's the biggest blessing for us, I think, is that there is an us, that we don't do it alone. Um, we have each other. And uh, that to me is the, the greatest uh, thing in this is the, those kinds of moments is what bonded us together, is going through the adversity and going through those moments of un you know sureness and we didn't know what was happening or why things were happening to us the way they were but we went through them together and then we were able to then have you know as you you put up the rock and roll hall of fame picture a minute ago we were able to then you know 50 years later um have that honor to be you know in the rock hall of fame um and have janet <laughs> induct us you know I mean, that's crazy if you think about that kind of journey yeah. is pretty amazing. So anyway, I, I just I just think it's God's plan at the end of the day. Um, and, and our goal at this point of our careers is really to just leave music in a better place than we found. Mm. It. Whether that's through the music we make, whether it's through the technology that we're developing, whether it's you know, the way we listen to music. Um, I just think whether it's the new artists that we work with whether it's the um you know the vintage artists that we are able to you know put back in the forefront to me it's just leaving if the, if we leave music in a better place we leave the world in a better place and i think that's our goal at, at this point of our careers wow well said bro and that's a perfect way Thank to you, end Terry. this incredible <laughs> interview you leave music in a better place than you found it man what a blessing to hear your story what a blessing to have you share honestly and humbly and, and be real people. And like I said in the beginning of this intro, you're not only great musicians, great producers, but you're great human beings from what I've seen and what I've gathered about you. And that, that, make, that means more than all the other madness. It just means more because your legacy will be intact, man. You know, you guys will get it right. You'll do the right thing. And people will go, those dudes were amazing, but they were just good people. Your families will love you. You know, it'll mean so much more in the end. So thank you for just being good human beings. We so do appreciate you. Appreciate you, brother. Thank yes, you for sir. having Thank us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> and as we close out, should they be looking for anything new? How how do they find you? How do they find any of the newest stuff coming out the gate from Jamie Lewis? Should they go on social media? How do they find you? Should definitely follow us on social media. I'm Flight Time Jam, and that's F L Y T E T Y M E, Flight Time Jam. Terry is Flight Time Lewis. Uh, we're on uh, Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on um, Facebook. Uh, there's a Jam and Lewis page on Facebook, so you can kind of follow and see everything that we're kind of up to. Um, there is a there's a show right now that people seem to be enjoying. I think we're 95 percent on Rotten Tomatoes uh, called Unprisoned. Mm. It's uh, Kerry Washington and Delroy Lindo. Okay. And it's on Hulu. Uh, and uh, we did the music for it. And so in the bucket list of things we hadn't done yet, we never had done music score for episodic television. Hmm. Um, so this was our first time doing it and uh, seems to be uh, very successful. So we're really happy about that. And hopefully we get picked up for another season. Um, and then we're in the studio right now with uh, Yolanda Adams working with her on a new project, which we're very excited about. Amazing. Um, there's a young lady named LMYK who's actually a Japanese artist that we just released an album on um, called Desserts, which is actually stressed, spelled backwards. No. <laughs> and, and we've and we've been doing a lot of um, 
uh, because she's involved with a lot of anime uh, in titles on on TV and in films. We've been doing a lot of that, so we're working. Uh, uh, been doing a lot of that kind of work in Japan. Um, we have a Stokely uh, single from his album Sankofa that's okay. uh, rapidly man. approaching the top ten. Uh, so it's actually with Snoop Dogg. It's with yeah. Snoop Dogg. Yeah. Uh, so I that's doing the program. Yeah, yeah. So that's so that's going really well. I'm sure I'm missing some stuff. We have a but we have a ton of things coming. There is a volume two coming before volume two comes uh, to celebrate our 50th anniversary. We're going to do some special things with volume one in the way of some remixes and some things for summer to keep people dancing. Nice. So look out for those coming very soon. But if you follow us on social media, you'll f see all of our kind of things that we're up to and we're just having a lot of fun i will say that and, and why did you stop the uh the just listen videos you were doing on the channel those were amazing those were awesome thank you are you coming just back time, to those? just time no just just time just we just ran out of time to do it it was it was tough to do them on a consistent basis yeah. um because we had tried to do it every thursday or every wednesday i can't remember what day we landed on and uh we were able to do three or four of them pretty well but then uh, just schedule wise, we weren't able to consistently do it. So we just kind of backed off from it. But when we find we can consistently do it, we definitely will be doing that again. And those that of you that right. have um, Sirius XM uh, radio or have your Sirius XM app, there is a show called The Jimmy Jam Show that's uh, on there where there's a bunch of interviews. That. So I hope people uh, tune into that and, and check that out. Well, you guys are doing a ton, and I didn't even know half of that, but I did know about just listening, so I was checking it out, which is amazing, and just mm -hmm. looking forward to all the great music that's coming our way. Thank you so much for being here. We send mad blessings to you and your families, and we just appreciate Thank all you. the work you've done, all the history you've given us, all the music you've given us. We appreciate y'all. Thank you so much, man. Thank, Thank you. you. More to come. Legends, More to come. Legends in the house. Legends in the house. <laughs> And with that, we will close out the night. We should appreciate having Jam and Lewis here. If you enjoy this kind of content, like we said before, do me a favor and hit us with a like or subscribe to the channel so that us get the most updated content to you as soon as it's available. And always, we thank you, the viewer, for watching the Beautiful Now podcast, Chasing the Impossible. Have a great one, guys. Take care. We'll see you next time.